watch Captain Cat in the room. Breaking news. Uh, of course, we have lost not only an American patriot, but also a um, pioneer for all of humankind, Neil, Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the moon. This coming in from Calvin Brodus, a.k.a. Snoop Dog, as he is known now, Snoop Lion. R.I.P. to my unk, Neil Armstrong. Stay high. R.I.P. to my unk, Neil Armstrong. Stay high. Coping strategies from Snoop Lion to you via Twitter at Snoop Dog. My name is Justin Robert Young. This is Jury Saturday. A live stream, not a podcast, where I talk and nobody can stop me. God damn it. Uh, I will do whatever the hell I want on this show, and if you like it, then that's great. If you don't, well, I don't know what to tell you. You know, listen, there's a lot of things you can do on the internet. You can go watch a cat ride a bicycle. I mean, I'm sure that's there somewhere. I don't know where it is. It fucking look like a, like a mall. Key? No, I'm not going to tell you where the, the cat bicycle is, but I'll tell you it's probably out there. But I'm glad that you're here. You're here. I'm not trying to chase you out. Listen, I think we got things off on the wrong foot. Welcome. We're going to talk on this show about a couple things. Uh, AIDS, that's going to be on the agenda. We're going to talk about Apple versus Samsung. I'm wearing my Apple uh, hat because uh, I think we're all legally mandated to do it. Whenever you get a billion dollar award... Uh, in court, I think you, you know, if there's ever time to wear a hat, that's probably one. Uh, also, we're going to talk a little bit about politics, and we're going to talk a little bit about movies. So, because I saw a movie that I fucking hated. I'm going to talk, remind me to talk about this movie that I fucking hated. Um, also, this is going to be the last Cheery Saturday before Dragon Con. In fact, we're probably not going to have... A jury Friday next week because I'll be at Dragon Con and it's going to be hard. Uh, I'll, I'll try to live stream from this channel. So subscribe to the, the Justin TV channel. But it probably won't be like a full blown jury Saturday because it's going to be a lot of my plate. I'm going to be live in Atlanta next week. Uh, man, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be super sweet. If you are not. Already planning on going? Now's the time to go. Man, now it's now it's time to, to, to pack up your shit and let's go. All right. Why do I want to talk about AIDS? There's a good question. Because I just watched... Uh, I've, I've been... Um, I've been doing nothing but talking nonstop about 30 for 30. Uh, the ESPN documentary series, which is now on Netflix. I watched a bunch of them when they aired. I didn't watch all of them. I'm now watching fucking all of them because they're all on Netflix and they're all awesome. The shittiest 30 for 30 is a great way to spend an hour. That's a guarantee. So I saw the announcement. JVZ209 has it dead to rights right there in the chat room. I saw the announcement. If you're not familiar with the announcement, let me set it up for you. Back in the early 90s, I believe it was 92, Magic Johnson announced to the world that he was retiring from basketball because he had contracted the HIV disease. Oh, sorry, HIV virus, not the AIDS disease, which he makes clear. Now, like most of the 30 for 30 documentaries and documentaries in general, the documentary kind of tilts toward the people that gave them the most access. So it, it, it gives favorable coverage and probably avoids things that are otherwise sticky um, because certain people talk to them. You know, they're not trying to bury them. They're trying to get a message out. And that's cool. You know, that's fine. Like, for example, in the announcement, a lot of talk about the gregarious mountain of charisma that is Magic Johnson. And you watch that documentary, and you can understand, in that period of time, why, like, giving him a talk show, which happened, wasn't a crazy idea. He was a guy who was just magnetic. He had a real magnetic personality, and you figured, he could talk to people. 
Probably talks to people all the time. Great conversations. He's friends with Arsenio Hall. Arsenio Hall can help him. You know, like, it just makes sense to do it. Now, that show is a disaster. But what it doesn't go into, which is probably what a lot of people who are new to the Magic Johnson story, who did not grow up. I mean, I was very, very young and living in Southern California when the Magic Johnson thing happened. The announcement, rather. Not his career. Um... I, you know, I'm probably among the youngest, you know, I'm, I'm, I was a kid. I didn't really understand what it was. I, 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 it was part of a larger mosaic of what the HIV and AIDS uh, ap, 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 epidemic, 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 not academic, not appendectomy, epidemic. What that was, not only to Southern California, but also the world. Um. What, if you didn't know shit about Magic Johnson, you're just watching this doc, you would, the number one question that they would want to know is how we got fucking HIV. <laughs> you know, you'd want to know that. You would want to know specifically three questions on a very basic level. Okay? Did it come from a man or a woman? Had he engaged in intravenous drug use? Now, they don't spend a lot of time talking about any of it. In fact, the entire, they don't go into when he thinks he contracted it at all. They even go to great pains to show that he had separated from his wife at the point that we are to imply when he contracted the disease. They imply that it is unsafe heterosexual sex. Now, I got no reason to not believe that, but they never say that, and they never say anything else. If this were a documentary that, let's say, for some reason were hostile to Magic Johnson, you would imagine that it would go into something like that. Specifically, any possible rumor that had swirled around him. You would think that there would be somebody saying, yo, that motherfucker was really close to uh, Isaiah Thomas. And they, like, kissed on the mouth before games sometimes. You know, like, maybe there's, like, a there's a gay element to Magic Johnson. Somebody might say that. Somebody might say, you know, listen, fucking L.A. in the 80s, that was a wild place, man. Coke, heroin, you know, like, you could be just fucking in the back of the, the Roxy. Someone fucking passes around a needle. Boom. Somebody was, was in it. it. It reminded me a lot of the Len Bias uh, documentary, which is also on 30 for 30. Um, they really don't go into how the coke wound up in that room, which is, again, a big thing. And I think part of the reason why is the guy that everybody thought brought the coke, and they kind of insinuate might have been dealing coke, uh, is somebody who gives a lot of time to the documentary. So, I don't want to talk about that. What I want to talk about is AIDS. I want to talk about what AIDS means, that, meant then and means now. And I don't know, I think there might be a line here in the chat room right now. For the people watching me right now in the chat room, I think there might be a line. There might be a line of people who see AIDS as a serious thing in the way that it was a serious thing in the late 80s and early 90s. I think if you were born, the closer you were born to 1990, I, I, I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think people, people understand it, you know. Now, a toilet bug in the chat room says, Justin... This is bullshit. Malaria has killed more people than AIDS. Um, yeah. Well, uh, yes. Which is my point. My point, which I'm taking a long time to get to, um, is that as far as we've come with AIDS, I mean, like AIDS, when I was a kid, and they kind of go into this, and what made me rethink this, is that AIDS was a, a, a death sentence, and not in a, 
fucking eventually you're going to die kind of way. Not in a you need to take care of yourself because you are at an increased risk to die. Like in a you're fucking dead, bro. Like it's curtains over game over. That's the perception. OK, now I'm not I mean, it was far. The, the reality was far closer to that back in the day. But the, the drugs and specific, they go into this uh, AZT, which was available fairly early on in the 90s. And then the AIDS cocktail, which is a billion different drugs that are put together, kind of revolutionized everything in the mid 90s. And we've seen it was no looking back past that. But this was something that at the time was thought to be. Empire changing. Culture shifting, humanity defining, and the fact that it's not now, that I can look back at that documentary and I can be like, holy shit, that was crazy, that was like a fucking real thing, you know, and it came relatively out of nowhere, and we fucking have, have made it to what it is today a very serious disease, but a treatable disease. Um, man, humanity fucking rules. Humanity is just, like, just nuts. Just fucking insane. Toilet bug uh, kind of reminds us of swine flu and global warming. Now, I won't touch global warming right now, but let's just look at swine flu. In fact, I'll tell you what. When I graduated from the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications of Syracuse, New York, and Syracuse University, the convocation speech by Dean Rubin, then the head of the journalism school, told us that the defining story of our journalistic careers would be bird flu. Whoopsie doodle. That one, I think you could go ahead and chalk in to the not-so-correct category. Uh, swine flu is not as serious as AIDS. It certainly wasn't as serious as AIDS. And what was fascinating about AIDS is that it affected, it, it kind of brought up not only, it wasn't just the disease. It wasn't just like... Um, West Nile or something like what well, West Nile is now. Let's say West Nile got real serious. We've been dealing with a disease that affected kind of everybody, right? There might be some, you know, oh, it affects city people more than rural people. There will be cultural lines drawn on it, but it won't be like AIDS. AIDS was very specifically drug users, gays. And this is as the gay community was continuing to kind of, let's say, culturally come out of the closet. They've come a long way, baby, like those slim-ass cigarettes from Virginia, the gay community. And this was something that, you know, you look back on it, and, and you kind of got to say, all right, listen, we're all going to walk, you know, we walk the path we walk. You can't go back and take away things. But I don't think the AIDS virus did a whole lot to endear people to the gay community. It was looked at as the gay plague. It was looked at as, you know, another way to demonize drug users. And then it, it spilled into the heterosexual community, and there was an element of, you know, that this was something that was introduced by the gay community and didn't do a lot to make people fucking think highly about it, that were otherwise maybe slowly socializing to the idea that, you know, gay relationships were going to be a more public part of our life. Um, it's, it's crazy to, and then, and then with Magic Johnson, here's another thing that kind of mute in, in the documentaries. They talk a lot about, um, they talk a lot about him helping the urban community. They don't quite go into part of the reason why, or, I mean, all right. Here's shit I can only say on the internet. Here's shit I can only say on a live stream that isn't a podcast because, uh, you know, it could, it could get me in trouble. All right. I would say that there are 
in my experience, the black community has a different view of homosexuals than the white community, the Asian community, and the Hispanic community. Um, I think that it's it's just it's a different way of looking at it culturally. If you can say that culturally we are all different and that there are lines drawn between people that we identify with by way of heritage and physical appearance, there is a different way of, of looking at it. And I think Magic Johnson did a lot to kind of bring those issues to the fore. The documentary does not go into it at all. <laughs> the documentary does not go into things that I heard growing up from not only black friends, but white friends, which was, Magic Johnson got AIDS, that means he's gay. Um, and that's something that... How is it different? I, I, don't, I don't... I just... All right. Different might not be the right words. What I'm trying to say is that it is something that you know, working with uh all right, you want to know what? Let me scratch different. I don't think it is different. I think it is it is what it is. It's just it's its own oh, and actually no, I'm not scratching different. Everything's different. Everything's different. We should not be worried about the fact that it's different. It's just there is a, a, an element that I don't I don't want to say is intolerant. But look at acceptance rates for gay marriage among the black community. I mean, it's, it's still an uphill climb. And it's an uphill climb in rural white communities. It's an uphill climb amongst Hispanic communities. There's, there are elements of society that are having a hard time with the gay thing. Um, and, and that's just what it is. You know? All right. This got into a weird place. This got into a really weird place. Uh, so that was that was what I was thinking with, uh, you know, uh, you know, and here, toilet bug. Uh, Hispanics are Catholic. That's why. And I mean, you could say there's an element, you know, of, of, of uh, a religious binding amongst certain communities. Blacks, Hispanics among them. Southern whites among them. Evangelicals among them. Um. You know, I think it's just, it, it is, it is what it is. <laughs> Vendetta, zero, blagata, Asians hate gay people. Maybe so. I mean, everybody hates fucking everybody. That's, you, you mean, it, it's hard to say that there is a, a, a group of people that hates other people the most or, or more than others because there's always exceptions to the rule. But all you can do is just look at the numbers. Right, and all I can do is speak from my own personal, you know, my own personal sense of it, and that's that's what I get the sense. I don't think, um, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a harsh condemnation. I just think it's a reality, and and it's interesting to see where things have gone. It was interesting to see what a flashpoint like Magic Johnson getting AIDS, sorry, HIV, uh, meant for all these cultural nexuses, because there was a lot of them, you know. Uh, the rise of the modern athlete. You know, Magic Johnson was a, a NBA player unlike NBA players before him. And he was a precursor to Michael Jordan and, and, uh, and LeBron James who became kind of cross, you know, just real explosive athletes, you know, that, that transcended sports, that were now brands on the level that nobody had ever seen. <laughs> All right. I'll tell you, we're steering this one out. We're in, I gotta pull up. I gotta pull up. I've just been seeing, I'm in the cockpit and I'm just seeing like, like pull up, pull up, pull up. We're getting into race and homosexuality. <laughs> Let's talk about something slightly less controversial. Apple versus Samsung. Now, let me start off this conversation by saying I ain't got no fucking clue exactly how to parse this here's what we know uh and, and thank you by the way call me djm says that uh he is he has given me a pass to talk about whatever i want in terms of black people uh so thank you i won't use the term 
that uh, John Mayer used, but I appreciate you allowing me the pass. Uh, Yoshi says, Jerry Samsung is going to win in the final end. Well, number one, you can't get an award of a billion. I think uh, Andy Anako said yesterday, you, you don't have an award of a billion dollars without there gonna be, there's going to be appeals on this uh, until the heat death of the universe. So, what are we to make of it? Well, here's what we do know. Um, from the first announcement of the iPod, sorry, the iPhone, rather, Apple was conscious of patents. Steve Jobs mentioned patents in the first 2007 announcement of the iPhone. He talks about multi-touch, multi gestures, and yes, they are patented. It's part of the fucking bullet points, and it's the only one with an exclamation point. Where do you think that exclamation point was pointing? Right up the assholes of anybody who Steve Jobs believed might steal this technology. So where are we now? Well, if you are a dedicated listener to Tech News Today, um, like I am, then you know there is an ever-evolving patent war. We cannot have the salvos of these kind of skirmishes without eventually incurring escalation or seeing these uh, trials, if they don't want to settle, to final results. The final result in this particular case was that Apple kicked the living shit out of Samsung. Now, you can say, oh, it's a billion dollars, Samsung makes a hundred billion dollars, they're not quite as sexy as Apple, but they make a shit ton of money, whatever about this. You know, Samsung already made more money ripping off the fucking uh, patents than they will pay out for them. Well, yeah, might be true. I know, it never, it's, you know, Samsung's not going to happily flip over a billion dollars, they're going to fight this one tooth and nail because it means a lot. It means a lot for their future devices. It means a lot. Now that they've been sanctioned once for it, they're sanctioned again. It's easier. It's more likely that they would be found, uh, you know, to be in violation of these. At least I think, he said without any kind of legal knowledge. Talk to Ayaz. Ayaz probably know fucking all this shit. I'm, I know I'm listening to Tech News Today on Monday. Explain this shit. Um, <laughs> Yoshi, I'll tell you what, man, Yoshi, Yoshi's getting, Yoshi's on, she's shipping Samsung, man. U.S. companies are going to hell and dying. I bet on South Korean and Japanese companies to take over. Uh, that We had that. That was called the 80s. That's when that was supposed to happen. Um, you know, right now, Apple makes more money than oil companies selling consumer electronics. Consumer electronics! What the fuck? It's insane. It's insane to think of. And I don't think they do that by accident. You do that by innovating. You do that by creating. Now, are these patents too broad? That's for someone way smarter than me to decide. But, Apple feels they're enforceable. And the judge and jury, as cantankerous as Judge Coe was during this trial, found in their favor. So, where are we to go from here? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I guess that's really what's kind of lost in all this. And it's going to take a little bit to, to figure it out. The general consensus is that it's not a good thing. That it will hamper design. That it will create a culture where you pay protection money to Apple or they will burn your bridge. They will kind of, you'll get a, a shady visitor from Cupertino and uh, they'll say, hey, you know, listen, uh, you make some good tablets. Eh? These are nice looking tablets, right? It'd be a real shame if they all fucking lit on fire, right? How would you give my friend Tim a call I give you a price, we'll work it out. Don't worry, you ain't gonna worry about it. We'll fucking make it okay. And otherwise, maybe they all go away. I'm just saying. Huh? You hear about that Samsung? Shame what happened to them, eh? Oh. Um. 
So, yeah, we don't want that. But at the same time, you know, the sense I have from it is that it's not going to be quite the chilling effect that people fear. Now, let me just say this in a completely legally ignorant way. I think Samsung got hung up because there were Samsung internal memos saying, you know, (laughs) that seemed to be instructions to make these things look more and more like the iPhone and the iPad. It seemed like that's what they were implying to me as a third party observer. If I were seated on that jury, that's what it would read like to me. Obviously, I'm biased. I like Apple products. I own Apple products. I don't own Samsung products. So take it all with a grain of salt. But it seemed to me like Samsung was in a uniquely weird place in in trying to make things look like the Apple stuff. So if you were a company that had kind of, you know, know, that Apple thought was infringing on certain things that did not have that kind of internal correspondence, well, I don't know if it would be the same. <laughs> I am wearing an Apple hat. I'm wearing an Apple hat right now. I was going to say for the podcast listeners, but there are no fucking podcast listeners. There's only people watching right now. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm an Apple fan. I like Apple. I own Apple. I happily bought an iPad last week. I was very excited by it. Um, so there we go. That's my Apple Samsung thing. You know, I guess here's here's the other here's the other thing. I, I really just don't know. At this point, if you're screaming and yelling about this and you're not a legal expert, I think you're just you you are as informed as I am, which is to say, not at all. We're all just fucking barking at the moon, taking our own internal biases, putting it in the context of this story, and trying to legitimize it. That's what we're all doing right now until we can parse through what this exactly means legally and understand exactly what the chilling effect is going to be. Because everybody who's the most critical right now assumes there to be a chilling effect. Andy and Akko basically said the biggest winners in this that aren't named Apple are Nokia and RIM. Because Nokia and RIM are dead in the fucking water, but they own a shit ton of patents. So now, all of a sudden... If Samsung was like, eh, fuck it, maybe we buy RIM. Oh, I don't know why everybody has the Italian voice today. Uh, Now, all of a sudden, it's like, well, fuck. Let's just buy a shit ton of patents so we can can fight stuff. Um... So there we go. I I just, I, I, I don't know. Like, and I don't think anyone knows. My point, don't fucking, DTA, don't trust anyone. Because nobody fucking knows right now. We might know in six months. We might know in a year. We might never know. I mean, I guess we'll, we'll know on some level, like as we see the evolution of the phone market. But it's like, will this put a damper on the development of phones? I don't know. I don't think so. I really don't, I don't, I don't know. All right. One more thing I wanted to talk about. And this wasn't on the thing. All right. I I went in a tweet. I went in my list. But uh, I'm on a rant. I'm on a roll with these rants here. I've already offended gays. I've offended blacks. I've offended Samsung fans. Let's get into Star Wars before I get into politics. I'm dropping bombs today, folks. That's what we have. That's what we do on Jury Saturday. We're dropping truth bombs. That's what we do. Star Wars. The fucking celebration is happening right now in Orlando. It's a bunch of people. Star Wars outfits. Getting Star Wars tattoos. Roaming around with like a cosplay Boba Fett who looks like a realtor. And has a sign that says... Now offering Death Star office space. Call one five 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 FET for you. That's what's happening right now in Orlando. I wish I was there. Two things that I'm fucking pissed off about that I don't live in Florida anymore. Number one, I can't go to fucking Star Wars Celebration. Number two, I fucking can't drive up to Atlanta, which I love that fucking drive. It's a nine hour drive that I just love. Such happy memories of. Can't do that. 
at Star Wars Celebration. When I was there a couple years ago, there was a big uh, panel by Seth Green and some of the other guys from Robot Chicken. And uh, they debuted a trailer for the then upcoming uh, Return of the Jedi Robot Chicken uh, Star Wars special. And teased the existence of a then nascent or in the you know, uh, beginning stages of a s- animated Star Wars comedy show that would take place outside of the general realm of, um, of, of the canon. Which I've always thought is, the, is a great idea. Let's do shit outside of Skywalker, of the Skywalker family. Um, you know, I, uh, I always think, I mean, it's such a rich universe, man. You can do fucking anything in that universe. Just go crazy. Go nuts. When I went, I was very disappointed that they didn't make an announcement on a live-action television series, because I think a live-action television series would be fucking awesome. I think it'd be great. I'd watch it. I, I, I would hope it's good. Because George Lucas can't write every episode. They can hire fucking good people. This year, they didn't announce a live-action television series either. What they did announce is a trailer for... That very same project that I heard Seth Green announce three years ago and is now apparently coming closer and closer to fruition. That is called Star Wars Detours. Star Wars Detours is going to be an animated series, uh, and there was a trailer that debuted yesterday. Too much stir and drong on the interwebs. Um, hold on. Let me just go ahead and ba-boom. A um, lot of, lot of, lot of doo-doo chatter about, uh, about the Star Wars detour thing. Here's my two cents. And actually, I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, does anybody know where this is airing? Is this airing on Cartoon Network? I think it is airing on Cartoon Network. Because that's where all the other Star Wars stuff, um you know, airs, but it seems like it's a show for kids. It's a show for kids with Star Wars humor. Maybe they haven't sold it to a network and they're just teasing it to people. I hadn't heard it yet, but I don't know whether or not that's because they haven't announced it or I just didn't see it. I don't quite know why everybody's so fucking upset about it. It's, this is probably the same thing as as the Star Wars Connect thing. That, like as a sub game to a sub game, they have the Star Wars dance thing where they had the fucking parody songs. Like is everybody fucking dead? Se- I mean, I, all right here. Let me explain against my position first. Against my position is, I am legitimately a little annoyed that they can't have a Star Wars project that I fully is like in my wheelhouse I would love a Star Wars project that's like fucking right right here in terms of what I want to see in Star Wars like I would love to see a live action gritty ass not gritty ass but like fucking just a live action television series for fucking adults how about that one I'd love that it'd be great doesn't happen the fact that it continues to not happen is bothersome to me that's a separate instance than them producing for what is a gigantic market for them, which is kids. Kids fucking love Star Wars. They do. They can't get enough of it. They love shitty things like the prequels. They love Clone Wars, which is apparently pretty decent. So everybody flips out. Says this is the worst thing ever. Ah! done with Star Wars because they're producing a thing that I it wasn't meant for me and I'm not going to watch. I mean, like, that's to me like saying, like, oh, God, they produced a little girl Star Wars t-shirt. I'm never going to wear a little girl Star Wars t-shirt. Get out of here. Oh, jeez, that's not for me. 
Everything needs to be for me, because I like this thing. Uh, Brett Roundsville, the Amtrekker, my roommate, put a tweet out there and said, Listen, if this had fan film in front of the title, everybody would just be excited about it. I don't know if that's exactly what he said, but I'm going to take it a little further. They would jizz like the Bellagio fountains. The internet would be a, a, a full of fucking synchronized jizz streams like the fountains at the Bellagio. Oh, did you see that fan film? They'd be crossing... They do like a loop to loop, and one jizz stream would go into it. It'd be fucking crazy. They'd love it. How hilarious is this? I'm gonna show this to my three year old, and he's gonna love Star Wars now. But because it's official, people are like, George Lucas, you've shit in my nose for the last time. I'm sick of lying on my back and holding my nostril open just so you can take pencil-thin shits right into my skull. So, I don't know. I don't get it. I, I mean, like, there's an element of society I'm just, I'm just not going to get. I just don't understand it. If somebody can explain it to me, then fucking explain it to me. But I, I don't get it. I don't understand it. All right, who have I offended? Blacks, homosexuals, Magic Johnson, <laughs> Isaiah Thomas, uh, <laughs> those who suffer from AIDS, Samsung fans, Star Wars fans, uh, Leet farts a lot, I've offended, um, George Lucas himself, so nine, Let's go ahead. Let's just let's just go ahead and take this uh let's take this to the limit and and let's offend everybody about politics. We are barreling, my friends, barreling toward the Republican National Convention, which will then lead us to the Democratic National Convention and put us into the home stretch, the final furlough of uh of, of this election. What have we seen so far this week? Well, we've seen the continuing hilarity of our Vice President, Joseph Biden. Joseph Biden uh, announced, or there was a, a thing this week, that uh, said that he was going to go down to the Republican National Convention. Why? I have no idea. No clue. Don't get it. Don't understand it. I don't get it from a strategic point of view. I don't get it from a fucking uh, 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 message point of view. Uh, I just, I don't, I don't understand. I don't. I absolutely don't. I don't know if I ever will. Uh, and I guess the campaign didn't either. Because today they announced during a press release, oh, by the way, he's not coming there. Here's, okay. I've said this from the beginning. For anybody who's followed this show, I I think the uh, you know I, I I think that the Obama campaign has been run at the very at the kindest, worse than the 2008 campaign was run. At the most harsh, I think we're going to look back on this campaign. And if he loses, it's going to be fucking fireworks. If we thought we saw finger pointing and, and blaming, uh, you know, uh, with the McCain campaign after that fucking exploded last time, uh, you know, it's going to be night and day compared to what we see with the Obama campaign if Obama loses. Because there didn't seem to be any fucking strategy on that ticket. Like it's just they they're 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 creating message within twelve hour cycles, which theoretically, and this is again armchair political opinion, you create an overarching message, 
and then you apply that systematically every 12 hours. That's how theoretically I would run a campaign, at least. Now, you can say that for whatever you might say about Mitt Romney's campaign, they're not taking chances, but they're sticking to a larger narrative. The president sucks. The economy's proof. I can fix the economy. Boom. Three things. And they're exciting the base by saying that here's a guy I'm going to bring on that has a real track record of fucking slashing the budget so we can get things there. That all feeds in to their narrative. What's the Obama campaign's narrative? And meanwhile, when you have Joe Biden, invisible butterfly catching Joe Biden, unchain the invisible butterfly. Unchained the invisible butterfly. Um, he's fucked up like four times in the last month, and then you're gonna put him where a person of his stature never shows up in the Republican National Convention. It's it's as if they're asking him to say something retarded. And I don't get it. Captain Shark said, I don't like any politicians. Good. Good for you. I don't either. I think they're all lizard people. However, I think that they're a race of lizard people that are fucking uniquely well-suited to do what we do to world leaders. You need to not have a conscience to run for president. For real. You don't. You can't. You can't have human emotions and deal with that kind of responsibility and the kind of criticism. It's impossible. Good people... Don't run for office for that reason. <laughs> Thought shots that Joe really wanted to go to the Mons. The Mons Venus, of course, the famous titty bar in Tampa. <laughs> uh, all right, here's something else interesting that happened that kind of went under the radar. By the way, that's the, the sound I make when something goes under the radar. The Real Wolf 3 screams Ron Paul really loud. And I know it was really loud because it had eight exclamation points. Something happened this week. For all the bitching that everybody wanted to do about uh, about the, the uh, RNC platform, which it's like, listen, if you have if you have a Democratic friend that bitches about the RNC platform, do me a favor and just say, duh, of course you don't like their fucking platform. You're for the other party. And the same way, if you see someone who's a fucking registered Republican who's like, oh my God, can you see what's in the Democratic National Committee's fucking platform? But no shit, you don't like them. They do their thing for their people. And the other side, the same thing. There are people that fucking have disagreements of opinion with you. It doesn't make them the worst people on the planet. It doesn't make them demons. It doesn't make them ghouls. It makes them disagreeing with you. And who fucking elected you, the person who had all the goddamn answers? Anyway, Ron Paul. I always joke with people who are big Ron Paul, uh, Ron Paul followers that Ron Paul, Ron Paul has a few lines that his hardcore followers go nuts for. And they're unique to him. You know, in general, you could have Michelle Bachman, you could have Mitt Romney say, we need to balance our budget, or we need to respect life that starts at conception. And, and they're going to go and get a huge ovation, right? But there's some... Uh, there are some, jeez, all right, here we go. There are some that, uh, are unique to Ron Paul. One of those is, and I liken it to a concert. Like, have you ever been to a concert for a band that's like, has a very de dedicated following? Let's say, for example, Fish, right? Um, and like, Fish plays like, the first, like, Trey Anastasio from Fish plays, like, the first couple, like, notes from, like, Gotta Jabu. 
just those first couple notes, and everybody who's so fucking keyed into it is just like, yeah, fucking got a jabu. You can't fucking do that. It's not like all all on the watchtower, right? Like, it's not like you fucking, like, you know, uh, Don't Fear the Reaper. Any band can play that, and the fucking crowd will go nuts, because they all know that song. But this is, like, a very specific thing to Fish fans. Ron Paul is like that with the gold standard. He says, and another thing about the gold standard. Ah, fucking gold standard. Yeah. Bring it back. Bring it back. They fucking gone crazy, throwing chairs, fucking spitting on people. I'm not, like, in a happy way. Like, they just fucking going crazy like a dog. Like, it's just saliva everywhere. They're fucking fist pumping, tearing their shirts off. Gold standard. Gold standard. Uh, in the RNC, national thing, in the national uh, agenda for this convention, they have a recommendation to go back to the gold standard. That shit doesn't happen if it isn't for Ron Paul. That's nuts. It's fucking cuckoo bananas. I, I would have never thought that, that was coming, man. It is, it is, I'll tell you what, it, it's, it's a... It's a, when people talk about like, oh, you know, the two-party system's broken, you know, you can think that, and that's fine. I, I don't, I like, I'm kind of of the, the, there's a great Winston Churchill quote of like, you know, democracy is the most imperfect form of government, but it's the best one we can, best one we have, rather. Uh, I think it's because I like this better than a multi-party system like uh, like they have in Europe, because you know, I think you can affect massive change quicker as opposed to being constantly divided on little issues. And you can have exciting smaller candidates that work either inside or outside of uh, the party, like Ross Perot did, like uh, Ron Paul did, like, you know, even Ralph Nader did uh, for, for the Dems. Uh, you know... You can you can do that and, and really affect change. And I think that you know, for people that are super Ron Paul fans, uh, people that are that are Ron Paul fans, you got to be a little happy. People are taking this shit a little seriously now because you take you you've been the guys who've been taking it seriously. Um. So there we go. Now. Where are we now? Well, we have the Republican National uh, Convention. Uh, you will probably see a bit of a bump, although uh, there was a really good column. Uh, I believe it was it was in the Wall Street Journal, I think by Carl, Carl Rove, uh, who was talking about just bumps in general with both parties. Um, and he was uh, he explained that it really varies, and, and you can't really count on it. It's not like... When eat, when you announce a vice president, you get a pretty uh, you know specific kind of bump, you know a, a dependable bump rather. Uh, with the convention, sometimes it's big, sometimes it's it's bad. So we're gonna see. I think you know uh, the question is whether or not uh, the the hurricane's gonna delay it, but we we will see where it goes. But let me just say this, and again. Obama's campaign came out and said, we are going to raise a billion dollars. They haven't. The Obama campaign was initially talking about the huge financial advantage that they were going to have on Mitt Romney. Now, whatever you feel about them as a, uh, you know, him as a candidate, that was something they wanted to do, and they have failed to do. That says something about organization. It says something about enthusiasm. These are two things that are very, very key to a campaign. Organization, enthusiasm. I'm not even going to talk anymore about how disorganized I, I believe the Obama campaign is. I'm going to flip this around. I'm going to say... That if Mitt Romney doesn't win, I mean, all right, here, here's an incredibly stupid statement. 
If Mitt Romney doesn't win, he doesn't deserve to win. And he, and, and he fucking doesn't deserve to be president. Because I believe that this is probably the weakest, I mean, certainly in my lifetime, the weakest I've ever seen a sitting president. And the worst campaign I've ever seen run by a sitting president in my lifetime. I don't know what the fuck they're doing, man. I, I just, I don't. I don't get it. If somebody can fucking explain it to me, then let me know. But I just don't know. Don't get it. And this is even a week. Mitt Romney said something stupid. Mitt Romney brought up the fucking stupid birth certificate thing. Just retarded. Uh, and, and you know, it's, it's hard when, they, when, when the Democrats spent the entire fucking week trying to pretend that that Aiken cunt was on the, uh, was on the, was on the what's it called? Okay, sorry. Uh, Prof Pod points out Carter ran during my lifetime, during the early parts of my lifetime. So, yes. Uh, that's true. Carter, Carter ran a puzzlingly shitty campaign. Uh, so, and that was stupid, but at the same time, the fucking Democrats spent all week trying to present, pretend that fucking Aiken was, was on the ticket, you know, well, vote against Romney, Ryan, and Aiken, and legitimate rape. It's like, everybody thinks Aiken's a dickhead. You know. Mitt Romney fucked up with the you didn't make it out of context shit. Uh, I believe you're 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 saying that you didn't build that uh, thing. And I and again, here's why. All right, let's do this again. Here's why a fuck up like Mitt Romney saying no one's looked for my. Uh, let me try. All right, let me let me try a Mitt Romney impression. Well, uh, no one's looked for my birth certificate. It's a shitty Mitt Romney. I do a better Obama. Um, Shy Zero says they kept the Romney campaign off message all week. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess they they had to deal with the Aiken thing. Um, You know, and that was that was as much about what Aiken was doing than what Obama was doing. You know, if Aiken would have dropped out of the race like he was calling for, um, you know, it would have it would have been less of an issue. But uh, I'll, I'll give you that. It definitely did stop him from talking about stuff. Um, Mitt Romney saying that no one's looked for my birth certificate doesn't affect him as much as Obama saying that you didn't build that thing because no matter how out of context or how stupid or how flippant either comment was, Mitt Romney is not perceived to be a birther. It does not reinforce an already constructed narrative. Okay, Mitt Romney is he's not Donald Trump. Okay, he's not somebody who we've seen in the past be like birth certificate, birth certificate, birth certificate. So I'm saying it might be out of context. It might be distracting. It might be not beneficial to what he really wants to get out there. But it doesn't reinforce something that people already think about him. Obama saying you didn't build that reinforces an already constructed narrative that he is a cradle to grave government creates and destroys everything kind of guy. That's what people believe about him. That's what his opponents say about him. So when he says something, no matter how out of context it is, when those words come out of his mouth, it is a political fuck-up. May it be fair? No. May it be accurate? Possibility. But you go back and read that, and I don't think that he can get away with saying that this is completely fucking, uh, you know, out of... You know, I think he's, there's, there's a part of that that I think does ring true. But let's say it was overblown. Let's say it was overamplified. Let's say it's been run for way more mileage than it was intended to. You can't have those words come out of your mouth. That's just dumb. It's not good politics. It shows a lack of organization. All right. Uh, slightly used, uh, who has built anything without the backs of American workers, investors, military protection uh, of assets? Okay, the, there is a, a base point there, but if you are trying to not sound like something, 
which Obama should be trying to not sound like the caricature that is being made of him, then that is a quibbling point. That is not a point that is worth it to make. It's not a point that you need to run on. But if you are Obama, you are running on, this is the turning of the tide. Here's what I did. Here's my record. I'm not running away from my record. Uh, we've seen the worst. We're starting to come back. It's slower than, than we expected. But Europe happened, and the Arab Spring happened, and we, uh, we realized that it was worse than it was supposed to be. Um, that's what you're running on. You're not running on, I, you know, the government affects everything. Because that's what people want to paint you into a box on. So that's my point. My point is that it's, it's, a, it's a dumb, unorganized campaign. <clears throat> um, all right. So there we go. Now, I said that up to the election, uh, I, would rev- I would talk about one issue leading up to who I'm going to vote for. Uh, and and I wanted this to be a dialogue because I I, I do uh, you know I love the fact that you guys show up here on Saturdays with literally no advertisement no podcast that's awesome I like that I want to have a conversation about it so let me talk just real quick about um, about abortion I believe that very personally that uh you know all right so let's say ideologically i'm i'm a pro choice guy i'm for people having the uh you know i'm i'm for women having control over the bodies i want a you know i want it to be legal and i want it uh to be as far away from government control as possible you know I understand that there are um, that there are people who see things differently, that see it as murder. I get that. Um, I don't agree with them, but I understand that they exist. Politically, I believe that there are two things in my lifetime specifically in the last 10 years, that have been used specifically with young, with, with uh, voters on both sides uh, over and over again. And I would say on the left, it's, it's the draft. The two things on the left are the draft and abortion. And as somebody who is pro-choice, I've heard it as a reason why I need to vote uh, for Democratic candidates. The draft is coming back, and Roe vs. Wade is going to be overturned. I think that the roots of this are in, you know, the the grand reflowering of of the liberal movement in the 60s. These were key issues, and they still are key issues. Um... So, the question now is not whether or not these are important issues. They are important issues. The question now is, are they overblown? Are they scare tactics? Um, And I think that uh, certainly the draft is. Every time that I've seen somebody uh, tell me that the draft is coming back, you know, uh, and I remember what's going on, 2004, the Kerry Bush election. I'd have friends of mine tell me, you know, there's a bill in the House right now to bring the draft back. And there was. There was. It was put there by Charlie Rangel, the uh, congressman from New York, now disgraced. And he put it there 
to make a point that the draft could come back, right? Um, it's not coming back. It's it's not. It's never coming back. We we went through the wars we just went through. Um, you know, it's not. So the draft is done. If you hear somebody talk about the draft, I don't think it's true. Second is abortion, and that's a lot trickier. But, especially in an era when John Roberts, who, by the way, if we can all fucking dial the Wayback Machines back to when John Roberts was confirmed and was fucking Emperor Palpatine to anybody who voted Democrat, uh, let's all remember that. He was fucking the arch-conservative when he was uh, first confirmed and then made chief justice. If he's the chief justice, I got a, I got a hard, I don't know. Personally, I got a hard time believing that anybody who's going to be on there is, is going to overturn Roe versus Wade. I think that Republican appointees have been found to be far more uh, tricky to, to pin down. And if Bush was supposed to be super, uh, you know, arch conservative and he put, you know, uh, guys like Alito and, uh, and and Roberts on the bench, I just, I, I have a hard time thinking that they're going to see this as anything other than uh, uh, settled law. Um, so I guess that's, that's that, you know, I, I really like the other a- issue is I think politicians are scared, frightened animals in general. I think that the only time that anything ever happens in this country is not because a politician does it. It's because the people make politicians do it. I think that's the roots of the protest movement, uh, of, of the, the sixties. Uh, that's the root of sit-ins. That's the root of the everything. Um, and if we ever got close to uh, to, to overturning Roe versus Wade, I don't, I, you know, I, I just I have a hard time thinking the politicians would stand behind it. I think they like talking about it. I think they like I think conservative politicians like getting people out to vote, talking about it. I think Democratic candidates like people getting out to vote, people out to vote, talking about it. But it's not going anywhere. I might be an idiot, man. I'll tell you what. You might come back at me and say, listen, Justin, you're a, you're a dick. You're an idiot. You can call me that now. That's fine. But I just don't, I don't know. I don't know. I got a hard time believing that it's going anywhere. All right, so there we go. I'll talk about different things each week leading up to the big grand revelation of who I'm voting for. Um, and, uh, and there we go. Maybe people will figure it out. But that about wraps it up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set, now that I've set the chat room on fire and everybody's screaming and yelling at each other, uh, I'm going to leave. <laughs> That's what I like to do here on Jury Friday. I like to get everybody all fired up and fucking punching each other and spitting in each other's mouths and then fucking just saying really serious things. I'm going to just throw gasoline on this fire and then leave. <laughs> Adios, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to dive out of this plate glass window and fucking roll onto the street while this abandoned warehouse completely fucking burns itself to the ground. (laughs) Uh, Oh, okay. Hey, I got an announcement. Here's a fun announcement. Uh, I'm doing a new podcast, and it's not this. Uh, I'm going to do a podcast with... Uh, Ashley Paramore, my co-host on uh, Online Ethicist, which is now defunct. We're going to do another podcast. We're going to talk about Doctor Who because uh, I um, have, have not been a fan of the last season of Doctor Who. Uh, I hope I'm a, se- a fan of this season, but I suspect I might not be. She has, is a fan, loves Doctor Who, and so we're going we're gonna to yell about it um, uh, amongst uh, each other, and uh, we're going to put it on a podcast. So... Uh, you guys will be able to download it, and you'll be able to listen to it. We don't have a name yet, 
So do me a favor, at reply me, Justin R. Young, with suggestions for a Doctor Who podcast name. We have no idea what it is, but we'll be recording the first episode at Dragon Con. Okay. Um, so there we go. Let me know if you have any cool ideas for names. Other than that, it's happening this week. We'll record an episode. We might even do an episode before this week just to kind of set the, uh, set the template and so people know uh, what we're going to talk about. Um, tardy for school. The floor of the tardy, maybe. And we'll have Veronica do the intro. Uh, that about wraps it up for this edition of Jury Friday. No Jury Friday next week, although I will. Um, I will uh, maybe on the iPad. I'll, I'll do some uh, streaming uh, on this channel. So subscribe to this channel. Until, uh, of course, NSFW show, live at Dragon Con. FSL Tonight, live at Dragon Con. I'm going to be on the Tech News Today panel live at Dragon Con. I'm going to be part of Brian's Scam Your Way to Number One live at Dragon Con. Um, weird things will be this week. Uh, oh, also, I played Turquoise Jeep at the beginning of this because I'm going to go see Dark Turquoise Jeep uh, on Monday. I'll talk to you guys about that. Um, and that about wraps it up. Um is Twit going live on, I don't know. Uh, oh, Epic Happy, yeah, no, it's not, it's called the TNT panel because they thought they were doing TNT, but I think it's just going to be me um, and a bunch of other people talking about things. Basically, if you remember last year, uh, uh, Brushwood, Belmont, Merritt, and Young, a podcast hosting firm, we're back. We're back and better than ever. It's just going to be the four of us on fucking 18 different panels, reshuffling seats and having the same conversation in different ways. Uh, that about wraps it up for the fourth time. My name is Justin Robert Young, Justin R. Young on Twitter. And please, my friends, by the next time I see you, please don't die.